Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm Roy, as you just heard, and it's really nice to see so many people here. So I'm a software engineer working at Red Hat, and today I'd like to talk, as the title says, on uh, building streaming recommendation engines on Apache Spark. And so this is the general layout, so I'll first introduce the concept of collaborative filtering and focus in two variants, the batch and the streaming, and then I'll look at the principles of doing a distributed streaming recommendation on Spark, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the practical issues when using streaming recommendations and why it's not a silver bullet. Sometimes it's preferable to use uh, batch recommendation engines. So I guess the first question is, uh, what, what is a recommendation engine or what are recommender systems? So they're a popular method to match users, uh, products and historical data uh, and behavior, uh, and there are lots of algorithms which you can choose from. So you can do content-based uh, filtering, you can do collaborative filtering, you can do uh, knowledge-based recommenders. But in this talk, I'll focus on this particular method of collaborative filtering. So when we talk about collaborative filtering, so the collaborative aspect means that you're using collective information from a group of users, and filtering is just another word for prediction. So you want to do predictions on the set of data that you have on a bunch of, of, of users. So the first thing we need to assume is that we have a unique mapping between users and products. So uh, let's say that when you go to an online shop and you rate a book or you rate a movie or rate something, so there's a unique mapping between you, that product, and the rating that you're giving. And that's basically all you need, and this method, alternating with squares, which I'll go into. So collaborative filtering, might seem a bit daunting at first, but we use it every, in our everyday life. So if you think about it this way, so the main idea is that a group of people that tends to have collective similar tastes will more likely have the similar tastes on an unknown product. So if you, if you imagine that you have two groups of friends, we have a group A and group B, and you share a musical taste with group A. So most of the stuff that they listen to, you also listen to. And with group B, you don't share any musical taste at all. So you basically hate everything they listen to. So if group A recommends a new album to you, so which, and group B recommends a new album to you, which group are you gonna pick the choice from? So I guess it's pretty obvious, right? So you're gonna choose group A. So this is basically, in a nutshell, collaborative filtering. So just as a bonus question, what if group B really hates an album? Are you gonna hate it as well? So you really don't have information to know that. So you, know, you don't have a, uh, a commonality between the, the whole ratings. So, so you really can't make that assumption. So the most popular method to do collaborative filtering, I guess it's safe to say is alternating with squares. And in alternating with squares or ALS, we assume that the available rating data can be represented by a sparse matrix and we have a sequential ordering of both users and products. So that means that each entry of the matrix corresponds to a rating. And the idea behind ALS is that we factorize this ratings matrix into two, fa into two latent factors matrix, and these two latent factors, when multiplied back together, give you approximation of the, ori of the original ratings matrix. And obviously, the more data you have, the better the, the approximation is gonna be. So we're gonna look at the batch method to achieve this factorization, so to, to start this on the idea of ALS, and then we'll jump into the streaming version. So the factorization is performed by first assuming uh, we define a loss function, and this is just a general form of the loss function, where R is a true rating, and uh, R with the hat is a predicted rating, so it's calculated as, as we've seen. And the remaining terms are simply regularization terms to, that help us to prevent with overfitting. So the first step we do with ALS is to minimize this loss function. And fortunately, this minimization has a closed form solution. That means we can define a set of linear equations which we can solve. And the way we solve them is to, we calculate each factor iteratively, iteratively. So we fix one of the factors, we solve the system in order of the other one, and then we just alternate it. We fix the other one and we solve in, the other, uh, in the order of the other one. And then we just repeat this process until we have a convergence. Of the, of the approximation, and this is measured by some kind of error measure or after a finite number of iterations. So you have uh, the computation is bound, so we know it's gonna finish at some point. And once we do this, then we can just multiply those two factors together and we get this approximation. So we get the data that we have, and the data we didn't have, we now have an approximation. So these this values are gonna be the values that minimize the, the alternating with squares. 
So just to illustrate how this works quickly, so let's assume we have a very quirky shop where you have only 300 products being sold and we only have 300 customers. And on top of it, it's even quirkier because the customers can use 8-bit values to rate uh, the products that you have. So this is quite an unusual shop, obviously. And the ratings matrix is going to look something like this. Now, since we're humans, we obviously tend to see better patterns in colors than in numbers. So we can just assign a palette to the numbers, right? So each, each number corresponds to a color. So I think you know where this is going. So we can just fabricate the final ratings matrix. And we have this kind of ratings matrix. And now we can visualize the progress of ALS. So initially, we have two latent factors which are completely random. So obviously, you're going to have a ratings matrix, which is random. And then we just proceed by iterating the alternate two squares. And you can see, well, after a, a while, it's doing a pretty good job, right? So it's approximating the, the original matrix quite, quite well. But obviously, this is the simplest case of uh, ALS. It's not very useful, right? We know all the data. It's not distributed. It's running on a single machine. So yeah, of course, it's going to work OK. Um, so you might be thinking, well, if you can do this, why can't we use this with streaming data, right? So we get a new, a new rating. So we get a new user's rating or get a new product. We just recalculate the whole thing. Well, we could, but obviously, if you think that you're a shop with hundreds of thousands of, of customers with lots of products, after a while, it's going to, you know, it's going to be quite of a bottleneck to, to perform this with, with every single rating that comes into, into your system. So it'd be cool to be able to do this in a streaming way. That means just to update every single latent factor, uh, product latent factor row or, or column or user product latent factor with a single rating if you have them. And fortunately, there's, there is a way of doing this. We just use stochastic gradient descent to factorize the matrix. And we're going to look at the specific case of stochastic gradient descent, which is uh, the bias stochastic gradient descent. So in stochastic gradient descent, or SGD, we have this concept of biases for both users and items. So the bias is a measure of how consistently a product is rated by different users. Or, or, uh, so in this case, it will be uh, the BX. And the bias uh, is the rating given by user X to product I can be calculated as a sum mu, which is like a, an overall average of all the ratings you have. That's going to be the global bias. And we also have the BX, user bias, and browse bias, as I said. And this bias information is now incorporated in the, in, the, in the rating prediction. So if you remember previously, you just had the R with a little hat. So now our new prediction is going to include that, that bias term. And with this new predic uh, prediction uh, formulation, we can just use a very similar loss function as previously. But we don't need to go into the details of that. So finally, this is the last slide with formulas, I promise. Now we have a very simple way of updating the biases and the factors. So we can do them just by calculating a gradient. So that's the, the term you have to the right. And then we can just update the previous bi bias or, or factor that we have. So cool. This is a key result that allows us to update the factors with a single observation if you want. And we still have convergence properties. So just to summarize the practical difference in terms of streaming data, I, I hope it's evident now. So in both methods, the objective is to estimate the latent factors, right, given the ratings. But with batch ALS, whenever you get a new rating, you have to recalculate the whole thing and iteratively. And with uh, the SGD implementation, whenever you get a new rating, you just need to update one row or one column of the factors, right? So that's very useful for obvious reasons. And it is important to keep in mind that both methods aim at exactly the same thing, which is calculate the latent factors, right? So they both try to factorize the matrix. They're not different in that way. It's just the way they approach it. And we can just see, as previously, a very simple implementation of streaming ALS. But this is, on a, again, on a single machine with the same data and the same ratings. And you see, well, it's doing a, a good job. It's slower to converge. But that makes sense, because you're just using one observation at a time, right? Before you're using the whole of the data to calculate the, the ALS. But now it's just using one observation at a time. But it's, it's getting there. So it's, it's, it's working. But again, this is a single machine implementation. I don't think anyone here is interested in that. We're interested in things that scale to, to you know, very large quantities of data. 
So we're going to try to implement this in a distributed fashion. And as I'm sure all of you know, this is where things start to get very tricky because they're not straightforward to implement in, in a distributed way. So let's look at the distributed implementation. But first, we're going to look at what Apache Spark already offers. So Apache Spark already offers ALS out of the box. So you can use the ALS in MLlib. And uh, it's a kind of a batch uh, uh, implementation, but with some very clever tweaks. Uh, I encourage you to look at the source code. It's quite good. Um, and uh, the API is quite simple, actually, to use. That's also a bonus. So the only thing you need to train an ALS model with uh, Spark is an RDD containing the ratings. So these are from the class rating, which is basically a wrapper around the tuple of user ID and product rating. And this RDD corresponds to all of the entries in our matrix, if you remember, the original matrix. You need a rank, which is basically the length of, or the width, or the height of the, of the, of the matrix, the, the factorization matrix. And you need a stopping criteria. So you can tell Spark, well, after you know, X amount of iteration, just stop. It's probably not going to get any better. And finally, we have a lambda parameter, which, as you saw, is a regularization parameter, and is part of the loss function. And that's it. That's all we need to, to train a model. So the question is just how to choose the parameters. Well, that's quite simple. I mean, a typical method would be to split uh, the data into two random data sets and use one for training, one for validation. And you can do, for instance, a grid search, and, and then you can just optimize with some kind of error measure like uh, mean squared error or, or something equivalent. So once the model is trained, you get back this, which is a matrix factorization model. And this is basically a, wrap, a wrapper around the two factors. So these are the two matrices that we looked at as RDDs, so the user features and the product features. But now, obviously, we want to build a streaming recommender engine. And for this scenario, we'll assume that uh, the observations will come in in the form of the D stream, right? So we can use the first mini batch to initialize the model. So, you know, the initial state where the, the feature vectors are completely random. And obviously, one immediate advantage of using uh, this as a stream is that we do not, no longer need to keep the entirety of the data uh, on memory or read it or anything. So in the batch implementation, whenever we got a new rating, we'd have to fetch the whole of the data or have it in memory, recalculate the whole thing. But now, no, we just have the user and product weighting factors. We have the new rating, and we can update the whole thing with just that one rating. So that has some obvious advantages. So. The, the Spark ALS API is quite simple, so I'm going to try to replicate the same kind of API, right? So this is going to work. You get, uh, uh, you initialize the model with, with, uh, with some set of observations, and then you continuously train the model as the rest of the observations come in. So what do we need to calculate all this? And so just the next slides are going to be just a, a brief step-by-step -step of the operations. You might need to, to do uh, the streaming ALS on Spark. So we've seen the formula, so we kind of know what we need. So uh, the first thing we need, obviously, as we saw, is to calculate the user and the product latent factors. How are we going to do this? So we have the data. And the first thing we're going to do is to separate the data into two distinct data sets. So one for the users and one for the products, including the ratings. And just as a note, all the values that you're going to see here are just for illustration purposes, so they're made up. So if someone you spot that they don't make sense, they probably don't. So I just want to focus on, on the, the actual Spark operations that you're going to be using. And so once we split them, uh, what we do now is for each entry of these two na new data sets, we generate a random feature vector, right? So this is completely random, as initially we have random feature vectors. So we fill a, a vector of size rank with uh, random values, could be a random uniform values, and we also have a, a random bias associated with each, of, with each of these entries on the RDD. So we might have uh, duplicate users and products. So the first mini batch could include X ratings from 10 different products, let's say. So these two data sets will include several feature vectors for each product in this case, right? And we proceed by joining these ratings with uh, generated user factors, which in turn will generate a data set consisting of product user IDs, ratings, and user factors, right? So we join them, and we're going to have that. 
And now we just swap the RDD keys, perform an additional join between this interme intermediate data set and the intermediate product weighted data set. So now we have everything we need to perform streaming ALS, right? So these are the, all the quantities that we need. So the second thing is calculating the global bias. As you saw, that's just an average of all the ratings. So, you know, it's just averaging the rating. So in Spark, that's quite straightforward. So we just perform an average on, on, on the ratings that we have. And finally, we need to calculate the gradients. And to do that, so that you can update the, the user and the product bias. So we've seen before that we can update the bias by calculating the gradients, right? The term on the right-hand side. And to calculate the, bi the bias, we just need to calculate the error term. And since all the other quantities are known, so the gamma and lambda are parameters that is specified to the model, in order to calculate the error, then what we really need is just you know, the predicted rating. And that's quite straightforward to calculate, right? We've seen that. So we know the predicted rating for the combination user X and product Y is just a dot product between the respective latent vectors, right? So we just do that. We have what we need, we just calculate the dot factor and we have the predicted rating. So now that we have the predicted rating, we calculate the error, again, straightforward using Spark distributed operations, right? So now we're almost there, last one. We just need to turn the gradients we have into bias and latent factor updates. So if you split this data set into user and product factors, so now we establish the gradients by aggregating each data set by key, right? And now we have all the quantities we need to update our latent factors. Okay, so we sum them because we have the duplication of products, right? And what we have, we have a trained model. So we have the two factors and that's all we need. So these steps define the entirety of the streaming ALS operation. So you can see it can be done quite simply with Apache Spark. So for each observation window, we calculate the factors and on the following window, we update them giving the, the, the current observations. So we've covered the initial case where you don't have any latent factors uh, pre-calculated at all. But what happens if on the next window we get a rating from a user that already exists or we get an updated rating or something like that? How do we do it? So you're gonna see it's quite straightforward. It's gonna be basically exactly the same thing with a minor change. So we're just quickly gonna cover that case. So assume we get a mixture of completely new data and data for products or users we've seen before. And those are all highlighted in purple. So for this ne next set of observations, we proceed exactly as previously with one little change. So now instead of assigning random uh, factors and biases to each entry of the RDDs, we perform a full outer join, for instance, with the current latent factors. And the idea is that we keep the existing factors and create random features just for the ones we haven't seen before. Right? And with, with this joint RDD, we can then carry on with the previous operations exactly as we've done. So how does this behave with, with real data? So I'm gonna just show some results. Uh, they're uh, comparing the streaming implementation with uh, Spark's uh, own uh, ALS implementation. And the data set we've chosen is quite a standard for recommendation engines. So it's a movie lens data set. It's widely used in recommendation engine research. And it comes in several variants, but we just use the full variant, uh, which is, uh, has quite a lot of, of ratings, 26 million, I think. And uh, the data set basically can be just uh, you know, converted to something which has users as uh, unique integer IDs, uh, product ra uh, products, and ratings ranging from 0 to 5 with increments of 0 0.5. So we'll start by training a batch ALS with Spark. Uh, using the movie lens database. So we already have the, we assume we have the, the observations as the RDD already. So we split the data into 80%, 20% for training and validation. And I'm not gonna show here the steps for determining the parameters. It's quite simple, a simple parameter grid search will do it. And we train the model simply by passing this RDD to uh, Spark's ALS. And now we're gonna use uh, the remaining observations to calculate the root mean squared error, error uh, the root mean squared error, sorry, between the model predictions and the actual ratings. And something else we're gonna do, we're gonna persist this 20% so we can use the exact same data set to 
measure the, to, to calculate the error measure for the streaming version. So in order to test the streaming version, we first needed to define a data source. So we started with the original movie lens data. We removed the ratings from the validation part, and we created a simulated stream. Uh, this is all deployed on OpenShift, uh, Kubernetes distribution. And then we just uh, use StreamZ, which is a, a project that allows to deploy um, Kafka on, on, on OpenShift to, to, for, as our message broker. And then we just use a stream with intervals of five seconds with a thousand observations on each, each mini batch. So this is just a, you know, a convention. We could have used other numbers, but obviously if you use a very low number, like one observation per second, we're gonna wait forever so we could have a result. So we just use this number. And we actually use something called Oshinko, which is a project that allows to deploy Spark clusters on, on OpenShift and Kubernetes. And obviously it's not guaranteed that the best parameters, the best model parameters for the batch version are, are necessarily the best ones for the streaming version. But just for simplicity, we've decided to test them with the same set of parameters. And for each mini batch, we then incrementally trained the model and we calculated the error measure and we saw how it fared. So these are the results. And as you can see, so each uh, point on, on the x axis is just a thousand, a mini batch of a thousand observations. You can see that, well, in the horizontal line is the, the batch ALS uh, mean squared error. So you can see that it varies quite a lot, but overall, it's trending to you know, a similar value, which is kind of the behavior that we expect. So the more observations you, you have, so the, 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 least, the smaller the, the error is gonna be. And, and it's actually approaching the value of the, of the batch ALS. So you might think, well, if, given this, if streaming ALS is so good, then why not use it for everything? Well, there, there are some situations where it might not be the best solution. And I'm just quickly gonna go over them. So this is not exclusive, obviously, to the streaming version. It's also a problem of the batch version. And it's a cold start problem. So this is the initial point on any recommender engine where you have too few observations to make any meaningful predictions. So if you have a small number of, of ratings, if you remember, most of our latent factors are gonna be random. So obviously our approximation is gonna be mostly random as well. So obviously the prediction is not gonna be very good. So even though this is not just a problem of, Spark of, sorry, of the streaming implementation, but also the batch, the problem is that if you're implementing a batch a streaming uh, recommender engine, you might f feel tempted to start giving out predictions in production straight away. And that might be a very bad idea because most of the predictions you're gonna give are gonna be rubbish. So a possible solution is just to Take, a, if you have it, take a big chunk of data and train the model offline, and then just start serving predictions on a streaming way after you, you train the model. So don't start serving predictions immediately. Uh, another challenge that, that, that's interesting about uh, streaming uh, ALS is that in batch ALS, we can easily estimate the parameters. So what do we do? You do a grid search, right? As I'm sure all of you do every day with some kind of models. And after some time, if you find yourself that the model is not behaving as you expected, the, the quality of the predictions is deteriorating, you can just retrain the whole thing. That's, that's quite okay, it's quite valid to do. So after a while, you get new data and you think, oh, I'm gonna retrain my model, so you just do it. And that's the problem with uh, streaming ALS because you're not gonna be able to do that. If you train a model originally with some data, you're gonna discard that data. And then after a while, if you wanna retrain the whole of the model, you're gonna need that data again. So if you're gonna refetch the entirety of the data, that kind of questions why are you using a streaming uh, implementation of ALS in the first place. So in this case, if you find yourself retraining the model quite often, batch ALS might be a good solution. There is another possibility to train, the, to train the model, which is you just have all a series of models, you train them with different parameters, and then you just prune the models that behave the worst as you have new batches of observations. This has an obvious problem, which is it's very uh, computing intensive, right? You're gonna have to train a lot of models simultaneously, 
And also, there's no guarantee that a model that behaves very well in the initial point might not behave very badly with, with more data or vice versa. So you might have model A in this case might behave very badly because we have few data, but obviously in the future might, might be a, a good performing model. So another consideration is um, performance. So this is a quite naive implementation of streaming ALS. And the batch ALS implementation in Spark is actually very clever. It does uh, some advanced stuff, like for instance, uh, minimizing data shuffling. So it uses something called blocked ALS, which uh, tries to, ahead of time, predict what are going to be the most common uh, paths in your ALS algorithm and try to partition the data in a way to minimize the communication between partitions. So in this kind of naive streaming ALS, you don't have any kind of provision for that. So if you're going to implement something like streaming ALS, you probably want to spend the additional time thinking of how to minimize this shuffling problem that you're going to have. And finally, uh, another problem is to do single predictions, let's say. If you want to do a single prediction, you're going to have to use something possibly like lookup or do RDD random access, which I'm sure that to all of you is going to raise some eyebrows because that's going to bring some performance problems as well. So there's more information if you want to just check. There's a, a more detailed, in-depth guide to streaming iOS on this web page if you want to check. Uh, if you want to also see some, any of the other tools that I've used and I've mentioned to implement streaming AOS on Kubernetes and OpenShift, you can check Red Analytics uh, IO website. And that is all for me. Thank you very much for attending, and I'll take any questions you might have.